Welcome, I am your host, and this is the Unanswered Questions Podcast. Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of my new podcast, Unanswered Questions, where every week we will endeavour to discuss a mysterious unsolved case that has many lingering unanswered questions. So I hope you enjoy, and as always, leave me some feedback on what you think about the show, and rate it as well. Now on to the show. This week we'll be talking about Chuck Morgan. So, 39-year-old Chuck Morgan was a successful businessman who was the president of his own escrow agency. He was also a potential witness in a state land fraud case involving a known crime boss. On March 22nd of 1977, he left his Tuscon, Arizona home to drive two of his daughters to school. After dropping them off, he vanished. Three days later, he arrived back at his home, and according to his wife, Ruth, he was missing a shoe, had a plastic handcuff wrapped around one ankle, and had his hands tied together with a plastic zip tie. He could not speak, but with a pen and paper he wrote down that he had been kidnapped and tortured. He also wrote that a hallucinogenic drug had been painted on his throat. He claimed that this drug would kill him or drive him insane if he ingested it. He asked Ruth to move his car because he did not want them to know that he had returned home. However, he would not say who they were. He also told her not to call the police because a hit would be put out on the lives of them and their family members. For one week, Ruth nursed Chuck back to health by feeding him with an eyedropper. Before his voice returned, he began to allude to a secret identity. He claimed he had worked as an agent for the federal government and he fought against organized crime. He also claimed that they had taken his treasury identification. He said that he had escaped from his captors near Phoenix Skies Harbor Airport. Now, after his kidnapping, Chuck became justifiably paranoid. He began wearing a bulletproof vest and even grew a beard to further mask his identity. He also started driving his daughters to and from school, and he informed the school that nobody else should be allowed to pick them up. On June 7th, two months after his initial disappearance, Chuck vanished again. Shortly before his second disappearance, he told his father that if anything would have happened to him, there was a letter he'd written that would tell him who was responsible. Now, that letter was never found. However, nine days later, an unidentified woman called Ruth and said, and I quote, Chuck is all right. I'm going to butcher this next name. Ecclesiastes 1218. End quote. This is a reference to a Bible passage which reads in part, and I quote, Men are afraid of a high place and of terrors on the road. Remember him before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is crushed. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. End quote. Two days later, Chuck was found shot to death despite the fact he was found wearing a bulletproof vest. His body was found in the desert 30 feet off the highway in the San Juan Springs area. He had been shot once in the back of the head with a bullet from a 357 Magnum which was lying beside him. Interestingly enough, no fingerprints were found on the gun, however gunshot residue was found on his left hand indicating he had fired a weapon. In his car, police found a note that had directions to the crime scene written in his handwriting. Also found in the car were several weapons, ammunition and a CB radio. Strangely, a piece of one of his teeth was found wrapped in a white handkerchief in the back seat. A pair of sunglasses was also found that did not belong to him. Strangely, Chuck had clipped a $2 bill inside his underwear. Written on the bill were seven Spanish names from the letters A to G. Also, that biblical quote from, and I'm going to butcher this name, Ecclesiastes 12 was written with the verses 1 through 8 marked by arrows drawn on the bill's serial number. This was the same reference that the female caller had made to Ruth. On the back of the bill, the signers of the Declaration of Independence were numbered 1 through 7. Also, a crude map was drawn, which shows several roads between Tucson and the Mexican border. The towns Robles Junction and Susabe were marked. These towns are apparently known for smuggling. Two days after Chuck's death, an anonymous woman spoke to an officer from the Pima County Sheriff's Department on the telephone. She claimed that he was supposed to meet her at a local motel shortly before he died. She then went on to claim that her nickname was Green Eyes and that she was the same woman that had called Ruth several days earlier. She also claimed that at the motel, Chuck had showed her a briefcase containing several thousand dollars in cash. He said that the money would buy him out of a gang contract that had been put on his life. Surprisingly, despite the bizarre evidence, authorities ruled that that Chuck had committed suicide, which I don't know how they came to that conclusion. They believe that he did so either because of the financial difficulties or fears for his safety. His family and a reporter named Don Duverix believed he was murdered. I'll come back to Don Duverix in a minute. Some investigators also suspect that his death was not a suicide. Shortly after Chuck's death, his impounded car was broken into while it was in police possession. Now, how do you break into a car that's in police's possession? That's 
a very interesting and intriguing mystery in and of itself. Around that same time, his office was also ransacked, and then three weeks after his death, two men claiming to be FBI agents arrived at the Morgan home. They told Ruth that they had to look through the house. They tore the house apart and searched for quite a while. It is unknown if they ever found anything or if they were even FBI agents, because when Duverix contacted the FBI, they claimed that they'd never even heard of Chuck Morgan. There are several rumours surrounding this case, including that Chuck was killed because he was involved with illegal activity or was doing secret work for the government. His death seems just as unexplained as the events leading to it. What was most interesting about this case was that although Chuck claimed he was working against organized crime, some believed that he was actually involved with it, because during the 1970s, Tucson, along with other cities in Arizona, became a place that the Mafia moved to due to its warm climate and controversial criminal justice system. Led by former New York Don Joseph Bonanno, more than 500 racketeers moved to Tucson during the 1970s. Their influence led to several gangland-style killings in the area, one of the more famous being the murder of investigative reporter Don Bollies. Now, Donald Fifield Bollies, born July 10th of 1928 and died on June 13th of 1976, was an American investigative reporter for the Arizona Republic who was known for his coverage of organized crime in the area, especially by the Chicago outfit. His murder in a car bombing was suspected to be mob-related, but was later found to be connected to his reporting on land fraud schemes by local contractors. Donald Fifield Bollers grew up in Teaneck, New Jersey and attended Teaneck High School, graduating in the class of 1946. He pursued a newspaper career in the footsteps of his father, chief of the Associated Press Bureau in New Jersey, and grandfather. He graduated from Belliot College with a degree in government where he was editor of the campus newspaper and received a President's Award for personal achievement. After a stint in the United States Army in the Korean War assigned to an anti-aircraft unit, he joined the Associated Press as a sports editor and rewriter in New York, New Jersey. Jersey and Kentucky. In 1962, he was hired by the Arizona Republic newspaper, published at the time by Eugene C. Pulliam, where he quickly found a spot on the investigative beat and gained a reputation for dogged reporting of influence peddling, bribery, and land fraud. Former colleagues say he seemed to grow disillusioned about his job in late 1975 and early 1976, and that he had been persuaded to be taken off the investigative beat, moving to coverage of Phoenix City Hall and then the state legislature. Bollies was the brother of Richard Nelson Bollies, author of the best-selling job-hunting book What Colour Is Your Parachute? He shares a grandfather, Stephen Bollies, with humanist theoretician Edmund Blair Bollies. He was married twice and had a total of seven children. On June 2nd of 1976, Bollies left behind a short note in his office typewriter explaining he would meet with an informant then go to a luncheon meeting and be back around 1.30pm. He was responsible for covering a routine hearing at the state capitol and planned to attend a movie with his second wife, Rosali Cassie, that night in celebration of their 8th wedding anniversary. The source promised information on a land deal involving top state politicians and possibly the mob. A wait of several minutes in the lobby of the Hotel Clarendon, now known as the Clarendon Hotel, was concluded with a call for Bollies himself to the front desk, where the conversation lasted no more than two minutes. Bollies then exited the hotel, his car in the adjacent parking lot just south of the hotel, on 4th Avenue. Apparently, Bollies started the car, even moving a few feet, before a remote control bomb consisting of six sticks of dynamite taped to the underside of the car beneath the driver's seat was detonated. The explosion shattered his lower body, opened the driver's door, and left him mortally wounded while half outside the vehicle. Both legs and one arm were amputated over a 10-day stay in St. Joseph's Hospital. The 11th day was the reporter's last, as his injuries were too grave to survive, and he died at age 47. However, his final words after being found in the parking lot the day of the bombing included John Adamson, Empress, and Mafia, and he had left a note by his typewriter reading, and I quote, John Adamson, Lobby at 1115, Clearden House, 4th Clearden. End quote. The San Francisco Examiner on October 20th of 1976 reported that Maricopa County District Attorney Donald Harris said a conspiracy by the county club set was more than likely mafia involved in the June 2nd bombing that fatally wounded Bollies. The mob doesn't kill cops and reporters. This is not a mafia case. The article stated Bollies 47 frequently wrote about land fraud. His stories eventually resulted in passage of an emergency legislative bill opening blind trust to public scrutiny. Empress referred to the New York-based horse and dog racing company of the same name, which he had written articles about. 
Bollers identified Arizona resident John Harvey Adamson by photograph while hospitalized and Adamson's former lawyer, Mickey Clifton, informed the police of Adamson's involvement in the bombing. According to trial testimony, Adamson had gone to San Diego with a girlfriend and purchased the electronics for two bombs. Police searching his apartment later found the electronics for one bomb. Also, according to trial testimony, Adamson early on June 2nd went to the Arizona Republic employees parking area and asked the guard which car belonged to Bollies. The incident sparked an investigation by investigative reporters and editors, resulting in a book titled The Arizona Project, with Robert W. Green assuming the head and drawing nearly 40 reporters and editors from 23 newspapers, including the Milwaukee Journal and Newsday. John Harvey Adamson pleaded guilty in 1977 to second-degree murder for building and planting the bomb that killed Bollies. Adamson accused Phoenix contractor Max Dunlap, an associate of Kemper Marley, of ordering the hit as a favour to his friend Marley and Chandler plumber James Robinson of triggering the bomb. Phoenix police said they could find no evidence linking Marley with the crime. Adamson testified against Dunlap and Robinson, who were convicted of first-degree murder in the same year, but whose convictions were overturned in 1978. When Adamson refused to testify again, he was charged and convicted of first-degree murder in 1980 and sentenced to death, which was also overturned by the Arizona Supreme Court. In 1989, Robinson was recharged and retried and acquitted in 1993, but pleaded guilty to a charge of soliciting an act of criminal violence against Adamson. Robinson died in 2013. In 1990, Dunlap was recharged when Adamson agreed to testify again and was found guilty of first-degree murder. Max Dunlap died in an Arizona prison on July 21st of 2009. Adamson was given a reduced sentence because of his cooperation and was released from prison in 1996. He remained in the Federal Witness Protection Program in which he had been placed in 1990 while he was still in prison and died in an undisclosed location in 2002 at the age of 58. Among the last words that Bollies mentioned was Empress. Empress, later called Sports Service and now called Delaware North, was a privately owned company that had operated various dog and horse racing tracks and is a major food vendor for sports arenas. In 1972, the House Select Committee on Crime held hearings concerning Empress's connections with organized crime figures. Around this time, Emprise and six individuals were convicted of concealing ownership of the Frontier Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. As a result of the conviction, Emprise's dog racing operations in Arizona were placed under the legal authority of a trustee appointed by the Arizona State Racing Commission. Bollies was investigating the Emprise at the time of his death, however no connection between Emprise and his death were discovered. His remains were interred in a crypt located in the Serenity Mausoleum of the Greenwood Memory Lawn Mortuary and Cemetery in Phoenix. The Museum, a $400 million interactive museum of news and journalism located in Washington, D.C., features Bolly's 1976 Datsun 710, which had sat for 28 years in the Arizona Department of Public Safety's impound lot as the centerpiece of a gallery devoted to both Bolly's and fellow slain journalist Chauncey Bailey. In response to Bolly's death, the investigative reporters and editors board decided to continue Bolly's work in exposing corruption and organized crime in Arizona. Led by Newsday journalist Robert W. Green, the Arizona Project team consisted of 38 journalists from 28 newspapers and television stations. They produced a 23-part series in 1977 exposing widespread corruption in the state. On the 40th anniversary of the Arizona Project, the Don Bollies Award was established. The first recipient was, and I'm going to butcher this name, I do apologize, Muraslava Breach Valduquia. What made Arizona most attractive to crime syndicates was a unique state law that allowed them to buy land through numbered blind trust accounts. This would allow them to remain anonymous and successfully launder money. Truck did real estate escrow work for at least one mafia family. They may have used him to do escrow work for purchases of gold bullion and platinum. This was a more convenient way for them to launder money. Starting in 1973, it appeared that he was doing several million dollars of escrow work in bullion and platinum. In reality, there was no bullion or platinum. Instead, the money was moved through several escrow accounts and legitimized. On one occasion, Chuck mentioned to Ruth that money laundering was occurring in Tucson. However, he claimed that he was not involved in it. He also stated that the less she and the children knew about his activities, the better it would be for them. It is theorized that Chuck Morgan was killed by members of organized crime in the Tucson area. It is possible that the mafia family that he worked for had him killed because he knew too much. One theory is that organized crime bosses put the word out that they wanted Chuck dead, a hitman then told Chuck, so he came up with the money in order to buy the hitman off. However, when the two men met in the desert, the hitman killed him anyway and took the money. This theory, however, has not been confirmed.
Chuck was a secret witness in an extensive land fraud investigation and was interviewed about it in May of 1977, shortly before his death. It is not known if this had anything to do with his death. Also not mentioned was that Chuck had been seen at several restaurants and motels on the west side of Tucson after his disappearance and before his death. Don Duverix, who I talked about before, investigated several leads that came up. He learned that Chuck was heavily involved in money laundering activities through his Tucson escrow company. From 1973 to his death in 1977, he was also involved in large gold and platinum transactions. He apparently received a large amount of money from these activities, and some of this money allegedly came from Southeast Asia. Duverix discovered that Chuck had kept duplicate records of the illicit transactions. Duverix believed that Chuck was killed because he still had these records. Another interesting death that is said to be connected to this case is the death of Doug Johnson, who was found shot to death in his car outside of his Phoenix office. Interestingly, he worked across the street from Duverix's office and drove an almost identical car. Duverix to this day believes that he was supposed to be killed instead of Doug. Now we're going to get into the murder of Doug Johnson. So at 11pm on May 14th of 1990, 30-year-old Doug Johnson left for his night shift at a computer graphics company. An hour later, he was found shot to death in his car in the company parking lot. He had been shot behind his left ear from a distance of at least 12 inches. At first, authorities believed that his death was a suicide. However, he was right-handed, there was no powder residue on his hands, and most importantly, there was no gun found at the scene. For unknown reasons, authorities have not determined that Doug's death was either a suicide or a homicide. His family and friends are convinced that his death was a homicide. They do not believe he would have committed suicide because he had just finished school and gotten a new job. He was also very close to his friends and family. Interestingly, Doug had a similar house and drove a similar car to Don Duverix, who lived across the street from the parking lot where Doug was killed. He is a journalist whose work was allegedly a threat to mob figures in Phoenix. He was also investigating the suspicious death of Charles Morgan. Now, in 1991, Duverix was contacted by a writer from Washington, D.C. named Danny Casalero, who I'm also going to be covering in a later podcast episode about the case surrounding his death. Duverix agreed to share with him the information that he had uncovered about Charles' money laundering and gold transactions. However, before Duverix could even mail his research, Danny was found dead with his wrist slash in a hotel bathroom. His death was ruled a suicide, but Duverix believes that he was murdered, as do I. According to his brother, he was very squeamish and afraid of blood. It would seem unlikely then that he would choose to commit suicide by slashing his wrists. Six months after Danny's death, Duverix learned from another journalist that there was a hit placed on him, but that Doug was mistakenly killed as a result. Duverix also learned that there were apparently other people that wanted him dead. A CIA official and an informant for Israeli intelligence confirmed the death threats to him. Duverix is certain that Doug was mistakenly killed as a result of a botched hit that was meant for him. His murder, along with the deaths of Charles and Danny, remain unsolved. No evidence of robbery was found at the scene, and many believe that Doug was killed after he was mistaken for Duverix. It is believed that Duverix was targeted for his investigation in Charles's case. Sadly, Chuck's widow Ruth Morgan died in 2006. All the cases I've mentioned also remain to this day unsolved. With that, this case remains open, but with many unanswered questions, it still remain unanswered. Please rate the show and let me know what you guys think about this and the many other cases I've covered. You can follow me on all major social media platforms, YouTube, BitChute, Dailymotion. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram. Links are all down below in the description. If you have a case you'd like me to have a look at or cover, don't hesitate to send me a message. I'm your host, and this has been the Unanswered Questions Podcast. Until next time, next on Unanswered Questions. Colonel Philip Michael Shu was a United States Air Force psychiatrist stationed at Wilford Hall Medical Center in San Antonio 